So far, we have seen how Raymond Tensor describes the curvature of the spacetime in detail. We've also seen a few properties that relates different components of the Raymond Tensor. In today's class, we will see one more important property of the Raymond Tensor, the covariant derivative of the Raymond Tensor, and then go on to derive a couple of more quantities, which also contain a certain amount of information about the curvature of the space-time. So let's begin with the familiar definitions of the Riemann tensor given here. From where we had explained that we could always consider a completely covariant form of the Riemann tensor in for space-times whose metric is known. Now, substituting that expression in here, you get the expression for the covariant form of the Riemann tensor, where the gammas appearing are nothing other than the Christoffel connections, which in turn are given in terms of the derivatives of the metric by this expression. So we could substitute the expression for gamma <coughs> into in here and obtain the Riemann tensor components <coughs> in terms of <coughs> the derivatives of metric tensor. <coughs> Let's now do this exercise in a freely falling frame. You know, a freely falling frame is the one that we usually call the locally inertial frame in which components of the Christoffel connection are always zero. Although the con components of the Christoffel connection are zero, it is not necessary that the derivatives of the Christoffel connections are zero. After all, a function being zero does not necessarily mean that its derivative is also zero at, the, at a point. So let us evaluate the components of this Christoffel, sorry, the Riemann tensor in a locally inertial frame or a freely falling frame, as we call it. So in a locally inertial frame, we could see that the components of R rho sigma mu nu given in terms of the Christoffel simple becomes much simpler because the last two terms which involves only the Christoffel simple components are zero. So we are left with only the terms involving derivatives of the Christoffel symbol. Now if we substitute this expression for the derivative of the Christoffel symbol in here, we can easily see that R rho sigma mu nu could be obtained completely in terms of the second derivative of the metric, which comes from the expression for gamma. So as you can easily see, if you substitute this expression for gamma, there is already a factor of a derivative in addition to the derivative that acts on G, the metric tensor. So the expression for the Riemann tensor in locally inertial frame appears completely in terms of the second derivative of the metric. It is easy to do the substitution and check that the expression for R takes the form
given here. As can be verified that all terms in, in this expression for the, the Riemann tensor are in terms of the second derivative of various metric components. Let us now consider a derivative of this Riemann tensor. Since I have considered an ordinary derivative, I would indicate henceforth such a derivative in terms of a comma. which is a compact notation to denote an ordinary derivative of an object. If we look at the ordinary derivative of R in the locally inertial frame, that has a much simpler form involving the third derivative of metric components. For, in, for instance, for this particular component, the derivative with respect to lambda takes the form del lambda, del mu, del sigma g rho nu, minus del lambda, del mu, del rho g sigma nu, plus del lambda, del nu, del rho, g sigma mu, minus del lambda, del nu, del sigma, g rho mu. It is not difficult for us to check the following. If we consider cyclic permutation of the last three indices of such a quantity, which is a derivative of the Riemann tensor component, and add all those terms, we get zero. To write it explicitly, if we consider this particular derivative of a Riemann component and obtain similar such terms, from here, by cyclically permuting the last three indices in this expression, first let me get the second term by cyclically permuting lambda, mu, and nu to get r rho sigma lambda mu comma nu, and then repeating the same exercise once more to get r rho sigma nu lambda mu equal to 0. Those three terms adds up to 0. This can be easily checked by making use of the expression for such a derivative obtained from the previous line. Remember, this expression for R, as well as its derivative, has been obtained in a locally inertial frame. So this particular identity obtained is also only valid in a locally inertial frame. However, any such, any such identity that we obtain in a lo locally inertial frame, according to the principle of equivalence, should have descended from a similar expression which can be obtained by replacing the ordinary derivatives with covariant derivatives. So I should be having an expression which involves covariant derivatives of the curvature tensor such as r sigma mu nu. Let me now indicate the covariant derivatives. with respect to a capital with a capital D symbol as we have been doing 
plus the next term involving d nu r rho sigma lambda mu plus d mu r rho sigma mu lambda equal to 0. The sum of those terms should be 0. Now, the principle of equivalence tells us that in a locally inertial frame, such an expression should have reduced to an expression which involves just an ordinary partial derivative, which is what this expression is. It is commonplace to use a notation, a similar notation, to denote covariant derivatives also, which is to use a semicolon in place of the comma used for an ordinary derivative. So this identity can be rewritten in that notation as r rho sigma mu nu semicolon lambda plus r rho sigma lambda mu semicolon nu plus r rho sigma nu lambda semicolon mu equal to 0. This particular identity obeyed by the covariant derivatives of a Riemann tensor is called a Bianchi identity. Now we will see what a Ricci tensor is. A Ricci tensor is defined as shown here, where I have multiplied a Riemann tensor with a factor of metric tensor such that the first and third entices are contracted. So clearly, since I have summed over the first and third indices, I will be getting a quantity which has only the sigma and nu, the second and the last indices of the Riemann tensor as its free indices. This quantity is what we call a Ricci tensor. The moment we have such a quantity, it is easy to observe the following. Since we already know that such a Riemann tensor has antisymmetry under the interchange of the first two indices given by r sigma rho mu nu, where it has picked up a negative sign due to the interchange of the first two indices, as well as the interchange of the last two indices, rho sigma nu mu. Since we know this is true, I should be able to interchange rho and sigma and mu and nu to end up with g rho mu r sigma rho nu mu and still get the same Ricci tensor, which means that I could obtain that Ricci tensor not only by contracting the first and third indices, but also by contracting the second and the fourth indices. That's one property. The next property is the following. We also know that the Riemann tensor had a symmetry under the 
interchange of the first pair and the last pair of indices. That is, R rho sigma mu nu is, was the same as R mu nu rho sigma. If I make use of this identity in here, we could see that R g rho mu R, now I could substitute this for R rho sigma mu nu, getting R mu nu rho sigma in course of that interchange we observe that the indices sigma and nu have exchanged their places which means that what I have got here is R nu sigma. Now since this is the same as that I should now have R nu sigma to be the same as R sigma nu, which means that the Ricci tensor that we obtained is symmetric under the interchange of its indices. Now you could obtain the way that we have obtained the Ricci tensor it is a covariant rank 2 tensor. However, we could also express the same as a contravariant or a rank, mixed rank tensor. For instance, if I multiply this with another factor of metric tensor, whereby I raise the first index up, then I get sigma let's choose mu sigma r sigma nu I would be getting r mu nu. I could repeat this exercise I could multiply the same with one more factor of metric tensor and raise both the indices and make it a completely contravariant tensor in which case I would get G mu sigma G rho nu R sigma nu giving R nu rho which is a Ricci tensor in a com completely contravariant form. Needless to say that such a contravariant tensor is again a symmetric tensor under the interchange of mu and rho which can easily be seen by observing that under the interchange of mu and rho the left hand side remains symmetric. Now suppose we do the raising of this indices in such a way that it contracts the two indices of the Ricci tensor as given by G nu sigma R sigma nu then we would be getting a scalar out of it in which all the indices are contracted, all the indices are summed over indices and this scalar is called the Ricci scalar. So the Ricci tensor mentioned here as well as the Ricci scalar obtained out of it are again two tensors which can be used to represent curvature which actually contains certain information about the curvature of the space-time and both of them are actually derived out of the Riemann tensor. Now it's easy to see that since I have chosen to sum over a pair of indices of the Riemann tensor, Ricci tensor would be containing 
only a certain amount of information about the curvature of the space time compa compared to the Riemann tensor. Thus, the Riemann tensor remains the quantity that has every bit of information about the curvature of the space time. Now, let's proceed to the next quantity of interest, namely the Einstein tensor. We would begin by looking at the Bianchi identity that we discussed in earlier. A Bianchi identity for a space-time, as we mentioned earlier, had the form d lambda r rho mu rho sigma mu nu plus d nu r r rho sigma lambda mu plus d lambda r rho sigma nu lambda d, d mu r rho sigma nu equal to 0. So that's the Bianchi identity. Let's now begin with this Bianchi identity and multiply it with a factor of g rho mu. So let me write it here, g rho mu. It's clear that by doing so, whatever quantity that we get must also be equal to 0. In order to find out what this quantity is, let's first pick up the first term alone out of these three terms in the identity. The first term alone is d lambda r rho sigma mu nu multiplied by g rho mu can be written easily as d lambda of g rho mu r rho sigma mu nu because we have already seen that for a metric tensor g rho mu the covariant derivative will have its all components zero. Thus, the action of this covariant derivative on G will always give us zero. And this enables us need to take G outside of this derivative. And I get this. Because of this fact, now I could make use of the definition of the Ricci tensor I have written down earlier to write this expression as d lambda of r sigma. So this is what the first term of this identity gives us. Coming to the second term, it takes the form. Likewise, d lambda, d nu, of carrying the factor of metric tensor inside, g rho mu r rho sigma lambda mu, which can be expressed as g rho mu r sigma rho mu lambda by interchanging the last two indices but by 
placing a negative sign to take care of the anti-symmetry under the interchange of those indices. And the whole term is obtained by acting on with the covariant derivative d nu on this. In this form, as you can see, we can, it is convenient for us to identify the quantity inside the bracket with the Ricci tensor with indices sigma and lambda. And thus, it is minus d nu r sigma lambda. So the whole identity can now be expressed if we also find out the last term. Let's start writing down the identity. The first term is this, d lambda r sigma nu minus the second term is here, d nu r sigma lambda. And the last term is obtained by, again, taking the factor of metric tensor inside the covariant derivative, wherein at this stage, I will not further simplify that factor, but leave it at that. R rho sigma nu lambda, the whole equal to zero. Let's now multiply this identity, this factor, this expression with further with a factor of g lambda sigma, which is another factor of the inverse of the metric tensor. When I do that, you can see that if I multiply the first term with this, I could again use the fact that d lambda acting on g lambda sigma is 0, and thus take the factor of metric tensor inside the covariant derivative and write, the ex write this term as d lambda of g lambda sigma r sigma nu, which is nothing but d lambda of r lambda nu Multiplying the second term with g lambda sigma, again taking the factor of metric tensor inside the covariant derivative, we get d nu of g lambda sigma r sigma lambda. But remember, r sigma lambda is the same as r lambda sigma. It's a symmetric tensor. When we multiply that with the factor of metric tensor, g lambda sigma, we get a scalar. And that scalar is already known to us. It is nothing but the Ricci scalar. So this term, when multiplied by g lambda sigma, gives us d nu acting on the Ricci scalar which is denoted usually with the symbol r. So that's the second term. Now multiplying the last term again with the factor of g lambda sigma, we see that d mu of g mu rho, I could take the factor of g lambda sigma inside the covariant derivative as usual and multiply it to g rho sigma nu lambda in which this expression, the last two factors, the factor of inverse matrix tensor and r does a contraction of the second and fourth index indices of the Riemann tensor. 
but we have already seen that that contraction also gives us a factor of Ritchie tensor, but with indices rho and nu. Thus, this can be expressed as d mu of g mu rho to r rho nu in which if you simplify this further what sits inside the bracket can be seen to be nothing other than the Ricci tensor with one contravariant index and one covariant index acted on by the covariant derivative with respect to mu. Observe that in this expression mu is a dummy index and hence it gives us the same as what the first term gives. So collecting all these and substituting in this identity, we get lambda r lambda nu which is the same as the third term so I could sum them and write it as two times d lambda r lambda nu minus the factor of d nu acting on the Ricci scalar all of them adding up to zero as per the identity We could now write this expression in a convenient form by first observing that I could express this term, the first term as 2 times d lambda acting on Kronecker delta rho nu times r lambda rho where Kronecker delta is a constant tensor uh, on which, which when acted on with d lambda is zero. This can further be written as two times d lambda by writing Kronecker delta rho lambda as g rho alpha g alpha nu times r lambda rho so in the first step i have managed to write r lambda rho nu as delta rho lambda nu delta rho nu times r lambda rho where there is a summation over rho and after the summation it would go back to r lambda nu and in the second expression in the second step i have written the Kronecker delta as a product of two factors of metric tensors and i have also made use of the fact that since Kronecker delta is a product of two metric tensors d lambda acting on Kronecker delta will be zero because d lambda acting on any of these factors of metric tensor is zero now we could simplify this by considering the product of g and the ricci tensor factor where this factor of metric tensor would help me to raise the second index of the ricci tensor to make it also a contravariant index. So I will get d lambda of 
g alpha nu which continues in the next step in the same form times r lambda alpha we could now take the factor of metric tensor outside because d lambda acting on g is 0 and get 2 times g alpha nu times d lambda r lambda alpha as the first term. Now coming to the second term, we can easily write that as delta lambda nu of d lambda r. As you can easily verify that if I sum over lambda, I get back d nu r. The Kronecker delta here again can be written as g lambda alpha g alpha nu d lambda in this expression we can take the factor of g lambda alpha inside the covariant derivative again since covariant derivative acting on g is anyway zero and write the expression as d lambda acting on g lambda alpha times r multiplied by g alpha nu. Now we could substitute in this expression from the two terms that we just simplified. We get d lambda r lambda alpha minus d nu r is g alpha nu d lambda g lambda alpha r equal to 0. Let us now take a factor of g alpha nu and a factor of 2 as a common factor from these two expressions. Then we get d lambda r lambda alpha minus half of d lambda g lambda alpha r. equal to 0. <clears throat> now for this expression to be true what is inside the bracket must be 0 which itself can again be written by taking the covariant derivative sitting in both the terms outside and writing it as d lambda of r lambda alpha minus g lambda alpha over 2 times r equal to 0. So this equation tells us that the covariant divergence of each component of the quantity inside the bracket is 0. That quantity inside the bracket, if we observe, has, a first, has in its first term the Ricci tensor in its contravariant form and the inverse of the metric G lambda alpha multiplied by a Ricci scalar. This means that this whole quantity is a second rank tensor. Let us name this quantity.
It is called the Einstein tensor. Usually denoted by G lambda alpha. It is clear that since each of the terms in the expression for Einstein tensor is a symmetric tensor, Einstein tensor is also a symmetric tensor under the interchange of its indices. Thus, this equation that we obtained basically tells us that the divergence d lambda of g lambda alpha, g for every value of alpha is 0. We will see more about Einstein tensor in the next class.